uh, loop. Yeah. Guys, I, I was supposed to you know, to this loop, but I have to say that we have a very nice chat before, and uh, yeah, it was very pleased, so I'm sure. Uh, loop Suya Tavin is uh, one of the co founder of Siamis IO, and uh, um, I think he will tell everything about his product, software, and so on. I had a chat with him in the last hour and actually overrun by half an hour because it was so interesting. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll give, it, give us a very interesting talk yeah, no about uh, yeah, wind turbines. It is a topic that many of you are working on. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. cool. Yes. Thanks. That's your thank you. Thanks a lot for the for the introduction. Thanks a lot for being here as well. Thanks for having me. Can you can you all hear me? I don't need a mic or anything. Is that fine? Can you can people on uh, online hear me as well? Do you for them? Uh, yes. Give your eyes. just reply. Is it good? Okay. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about yeah, finite element analysis and how you can use that for you know when things go wrong with with wind turbines. Um, it's going to be mostly. It's it's not a PowerPoint presentation. So I have a few slides, but it's really that's really going to be very short. It's just to give you some backgrounds to, about like you know why I'm here. Uh, I'm part of a company called Simis, which is a Norwegian startup. And we develop a software called Ashes. So it's an aeroelastic software. It's a wind turbine simulation software. And the company was founded uh, yeah, 10 years ago. But we're still a very small company. So yeah, this is the team. So you know, like the um, Paul Thomasen is the CEO, Perivar is the CTO. And yeah, that's me. Or well, that, that was me 10 years ago. Sorry. And um, yeah, so Ashes is the software that we're developing. So that's the kind of the, the only product that we're uh, that we're developing in the company so far. And Ashes stands for Aero Servo Hydro Elastic Simulations. So it's it's a finite element software. So it's it's hundred uh, hundred percent finite element for wind turbine simulations. And we compute wind, uh, wave, well, or mar marine loads. Soil structure interaction control system, which is you know kind of telling you how fast the wind turbine should be spinning or you know things like that. That's control system dynamics, which is also included, and it's all done in a time domain. All done in a time domain, so dynamic and it's all coupled, which is it's very important to say you know what is the effect of say the control system on the hydrodynamic loads because if, if the control system does something special, then you know maybe the 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 tower is going to move in a certain way, and then the loads from the waves on the on my um, wind turbine are going to you know behave in some certain way. So it's important that everything is coupled. Okay, and yeah, and have some free and post processing tools in the in the software as well. Um, and yeah, just you know really quickly. So it's a software that was developed for the industry. As you will see, um, for various reasons, it's. Turns out that there's most it's mostly universities using it because it's kind of very visual and very well. We want to believe that it's very user friendly and so on. So, so it, it is a software. It is a commercial software for it's for industry and it is used by by you know companies doing wind turbine design. But it's also a uh, software that can be used in in other contexts. Um, there is a free version, a two week trial period that you can have if you go to Simis.io. So you know, feel free to download it. If you're on your computer right now, and if, if you feel like, feel free to you know get the software and kind of try to do some of the things that I'm that I'm doing as well. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's a bit addictive to you know start doing things like this. Um, so but you know, feel free to go and, and and have a look. And it's 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 real free. It's not like you know uh, put your credit card and then at the end we charge. It's like you know you just download the software and and you have access to it. Um, okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to start showing like different things that can happen to a to a wind turbine, and how yeah how, how we do how we deal with them in finite element software. So yeah, we're going to have a look at these these five things, um, and I'll go into detail. In, you know, um, for each of them, I'll go into details. So the first one is is loss of torque. And I just wanted to show this video. So I hope this works. It's uh, I mean, it's a classic. You might have seen it uh, already. 
Have you, can you tell me if you've seen this? Has someone seen this video already? Yeah, you have. Anyone else? No. So this is a wind turbine that's like overspeeding. You know, like things went wrong. Like we're going to talk about water. Things went wrong and it overspeeds. And then, well, you know, it's like the blades hit the tower and everything like collapses. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll just show it quickly again. What happens here is that one of the blades hits the tower and then, you know, there's like an imbalance in the masses of the rotor and then like, you know, everything goes goes uh, downhill from there. So this video is very interesting because it, it's, if you analyze what's, what happened there, it tells you a lot about, about wind turbines. So yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, uh, that, that's why I wanted to talk about this one. I, I'm going to use the, I'm going to show you the, I'm going to use a version that's not, uh, online just yet. So, so that's why, you know, if you download, if you download the software, you won't, you won't have to, you know, to deal with this, like ugly piece of code. It's just, uh, it's just cause I wanted to show you from the, from the latest version. Okay. So, so this is our software. Uh, if you download it, you will get exactly this and you have like a few, a few default models that you can, that you can use. Okay. For the analysis or for studying the case that I just showed you now, I'm going to use this this model, which is um, it's it's just an onshore an onshore wind turbine, so a wind turbine that's that's built on on land. Um, I mean, I'm just this is not a this is not a tutorial, okay? So you know, I'm just going to be doing things. If you don't if you don't get what I'm doing, just you know, you can always ask. You can you can you know feel free to interrupt, and we can have this as a conversation. But uh, just what's interesting here is to see kind of the results, okay? But so the first thing that I want to tell you is that uh, there's two things that failed in this in this video that we saw. One is that there was nothing to, there was no brake applied on the rotor. So the rotor, you know, like the three blades that were that were spinning, there was no brake applied there. And the second one is that the blades were supposed to have pitched to slow down the wind turbine. I'm going to show you what the pitch is, okay? Just to just to make it clear. So if I come here and I say that I want to set the pitch scheme to live. Okay, so now have a look at the blades, and I'm going to show you what what pitching a blade means. Okay, so can you see how the like how the blades are rotating around their own axis? Okay, so that's that's the that's the that's the that's that's what we what it means when a blade is pitching. Can I ask you? So I don't really know how much people know here about wind turbines and stuff. Who knew? Like, do you know what what this is? Did you know what pitching the blades is, for example? No, not really. Okay, cool. So, so then I guess it's good that I that I that I explained it. So this is one thing that didn't work, and the other one, as I said, is that there was nothing kind of slowing down. There was no brake applied on this on this uh, on the shaft here. Okay, so this is rotating, and this. In, the, in this case, something was supposed to be like stopping it, and we'll we'll have a look at what this was. So what I want to show you here is, let's see, the aerodynamic torque okay, and the generator torque. Okay, so that is uh, this one here. So yeah, I'm gonna put both of them together. Okay, now I start my simulation. So there's two curves right now here on the on the right of the screen. Okay. The the blue curve is the torque that is applied by the by the wind onto the main shaft of my of my wind turbine. Okay. So the blue the blue the blue curve here is, is basically the sum of all these you know little vectors here, all these individual loads times the times the arm to, to, to the to the center of the of the hub. But so the blue the blue curve is what is trying to spin my wind turbine. Okay, so the the, the, the blue curve is what we want is, is is what is making my wind turbine rotate, and is the aerodynamic torque. The red one is the generator torque, and this one is acting in the opposite direction. So it's kind of trying to slow the wind turbine down. And that is what you know that's that's where the power comes from. So you know you have like well you could imagine that you put like a big resistive loads and then that's kind of producing a torque on this like on this uh, on this spinning uh you know contraption and that's that's what's that's what's breaking the wind turbine so you know once the wind turbine is kind of on a steady state you have like you have that both are roughly equal so you have the aerodynamic uh, torque and the generator torque that are 
more or less equal. Does this make sense? More or less? OK, cool. So I'm going to show you a few more things. Uh, one is the rotational speed. So the RPM, the how fast the, <coughs> the rotor is turning. Another one is going to be the tip deflection. So this is on this blade, the blade that's lit up now, the tip deflection out of plane is how far this bit here is is moving um, away from the from the rotor plane. The rotor plane is the the planes as defined by the three blades. So here, what you're seeing is how far it's it's moving backwards, kind of. Okay. And again, because this is all finite element software, I also want to have a look into you know what's happening inside the blades. So we're gonna open an element here. Okay, this one for example. And then I'm adding a sensor and we're going to look at the actual force. So the actual force is, uh, you know, how much you're like kind of pulling on the blade or, or, or pushing the blade. Okay. And I'm going to start my simulation again. Okay. So now what we have here is the rotational speed, which is now constant. It's constant because both my, both my, uh, my torques are the same. So basic seconds Newton law. You have like you know sum of forces is mass times acceleration, sum of torques is rotational inertia times rotational acceleration. So if my two torques, if the sum of the torques is zero, then the acceleration is zero. So that's why the the rotation speed is constant. This is the okay the tip deflection. So you know my my the blade is the blade is moving a bit backwards. So the tip is is a little bit backwards. And then this is the actual force. Uh, what's interesting here? So let's see. We're looking at at this blade here. What's interesting here is that the the actual force is is the maximum when the when, when the blade is pointing downwards, right? Because you have so what's what's creating this force right now is the fact that the blade is rotating, so it's you know centrifugal effects, and it's also gravity. So when the blade is pointing downwards, the 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 gravity is pulling it is is increasing that force. But when you spawn it when it's pointing upwards, you know you don't have that. Uh, so that's what you see here. Okay, all clear so far? Cool. So let's see. So now we're going to try to reproduce what happened in that video that I showed you. And for that, I can say that I suddenly have a loss of torque. So at 10 seconds, we're going to lose the generator torque. Okay, so I just start my simulation again. And you know, there's a little bit of transient, so you know, it takes a, a bit of time to kind of reach the the same speeds. Um, yeah, the same speed, the, the same speed that we had before. And now at 10 seconds, we we lose the we lose the torque. So this red curve here is gonna is gonna go down. What's gonna happen? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically news. So yeah, I mean, spot on. Obviously, again, Newton's second law, right? So suddenly you have a torque, you don't have anything stopping it. So you know what you can see now is we get the RPM, so the rotational speed that is increasing a lot. And as you were saying, we get like the deflection, which is here, which is also increasing, and the actual force is also increasing. And if I look here, I mean, we, we can zoom in a little bit, and you can see that now the blade is kind of getting really close to. It's getting really, really, really close to the tower. We're not there. The we're not at the states of the video yet uh, because this is a relatively, you know, low wind speed. So we're not we're, we're not hitting the hitting the tower. I could increase the I could increase the the wind speeds and then, you know, and then eventually you would see that. I think probably if if I'm at even 50 meters per second, yeah, I think you can already see that here we're hitting the tower. There's nothing. If it hits the tower, there's nothing in the software. Nothing happens. Like it just kind of keeps going. So you know, you you would have to to check yourself that it's not a that is not hitting. But yeah, so that's that is that is exactly what happens in this video. Is that suddenly the the generator torque was lost, and then the wind turbine just like you know speeds up. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yes, this is so yeah, the question for, for the people online, the question is, is this happening in real time? 
And the answer is yes. Yeah, this is a uh, this is real time. Uh, so so when I increase the the speed now, the wind speed, I, I did increase it in in real time. Um, cool. So now we're gonna. So so this is what happened in the video, and that that should not happen. From uh, checking Wikipedia, which didn't have many sources, so I'm not sure how much we can trust that. But uh, talking about this this event that I showed you on the video. They were saying that the error was that a gear inside the generator or you know inside the gearbox uh, broke, and then nothing was connecting the the generator to this this uh, this uh, shaft that is holding the the blades. So so because of that, you know nothing was stopping it. So essentially, we just lost the torque, and then you see you see what happened here. There was a second failure, which is that the blades did not pitch, and I'm going to show you uh, what should have happened if the blades had pitched. So for that, I can use a Python script. And I have it here. Controller, pitch to feather. And then I think I have to set it. Yeah, exactly. So the pitch should come from Python. Cool. I know it's going to be the same thing. It's a little bit slow. Uh, I'm not sure why. I think it doesn't like when I share my screen. So, so right now it's, it's yeah, it's, it's lower than usual. But right now what's going to happen is that at 10 seconds, with, we are both going to lose a generator torque as before, but we're also going to be pitching the blades. OK, I know you can see. So again, we're losing the torque. But now the blades start pitching. It's a bit messy, so I'm just going to remove the visualization of the loads. But now what you can see, it's a completely different picture. So now the, the, the tip of the blade is not like getting close to the tower anymore. So now you can see that it even became negative, which means that it moves in the other, in the other direction. The rotational speed, which you have here, is actually decreasing back to zero. Because now the blades are, you know, they're in a position where they're not really capturing the wind anymore. So now this is, this is like an emergency shutdown. And now the blades are supposed to keep the wind turbine from spinning, basically. OK, so this is this was the second failure. This, this is something that should have happened, but that yeah, did, did, did not happen. And I, I, don't, I don't know why. I don't think that this Wikipedia page, Wikipedia page had uh, an explanation for that. Cool. So yeah, that was this, this one uh, failure event. Uh, do you have any questions about this? I'll move to the, I can move to, to the next one. So the next one was OK. I mean, I, I just added um, this was in case, uh, you know, so I can share the slides and, and there's like a little bit of information. There's a video where we explain where I explain exactly this this event. So you can also you can also see it here. So the next one that we are going to are, are going to look into is. If a mooring line is breaking, so that's for a for a floating wind turbine. So I just created the model here. So this these type of wind turbines, of floating wind turbines, maybe I can show the C just so that you see that it's it's actually a floating wind turbine. Okay. So there's different types of floaters. Uh, this one is called a spar. There's others, other types that are you know more or less common. Uh, and this one in particular is well, it's it's based on uh, a model that's called high wind. High wind, uh, high wind model. So yeah, there's there's one out there that looks really similar to this. Uh, I think I put a well, I put a picture of it, but you don't really see what happens below, so you so you can't you can't really see. But what I wanted to look into here is uh, what happens when one of the mooring lines breaks. So you know this. I'm just going to remove this. This wind turbine here has three mooring lines, but this one um. I'm not modeling this one. I'm modeling just by applying a load. So I'm just like kind of you know pulling on the structure as much as an actual mooring line would be pulling. And now what we're going to look at is so the motion of the floater. So I'm just going to add this first and then explain what it is. And yeah, the acceleration of the nacelle. Okay, so. We have a few graphs here. 
this one here, that's telling me how much my my wind turbine is moving backwards. Okay, so a positive number means that yeah, that we're moving like backwards, like kind of out of the wind. Uh, and this one here is so this is very unfortunate. Uh, it's also called pitch, but it has nothing to do with the blades. Okay. This means how much the the floater is kind of tilting forward and backwards. Okay, and this is something that you don't want to be you don't want to be too much, uh, obviously. And this here is the acceleration of the the hub. So this point here, that's 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 called the hub. And this is telling you how much that is moving. Okay, what's the acceleration in the hub? So now I have my wind turbine with my three moving lines. And at 30 seconds, this one is going to disappear. So we're we're simulating that it just suddenly breaks. The, um, it's kind of hard to get information on these things because in the wind industry, everything is very secretive. Okay. So, but my understanding is that today, the way you would um, know that a marine line has broken is by by tracking the displacement of the wind turbine. OK, so if you see that your wind turbine is moving too much, then it's because nothing is holding it back. There are some people that are trying to find like better ways to do this. And in particular, one way is to check the acc accelerations. So if I start my simulation again, 30 seconds, my moving line breaks. So you can see that I don't have my load anymore. And what's interesting to see here in the acceleration is that you have you have a certain peak in the acceleration. You, have, you suddenly have like a lot of um, yeah, a lot of vibrations, and this happens you know almost instantly after the moving line is broken. So this is very interesting because it allows you to say, okay, my my wind turbine has you know is not is not being held anymore by the moving lines. Shut it down, you know, and then you would enter the same procedure that we saw before, where you start pitching the blades just to just to stop the 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 wind turbine from spinning. Um, the other way to so the way that is done today, as far as I know, is by yeah checking the checking the position. So you can see, I mean, well, this is pretty obvious, right? Like there's nothing, there's no marine line here, so we're just like pushing the wind turbine backwards, and then just it's just gonna keep moving until I don't know, until this marine line stop it, or or until we we stop it from rotating. Um, it's it's interesting to say that for this one, uh, so the guys that developed this, this model, they claim that mooring lines are redundant. So they're saying that even if one mooring line was broken, the wind turbine could still be operating. So I think, so, you know, to what I understand is that what I, that means that, you know, if, if this happens, this that I'm showing happens, then they can just wait for it to like, you know, keep producing energy until they have time to go and, and, and fix it. Don't quote me on that, okay? But that's, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that, that's that's what they're, they're currently claiming. So if you were to, if you were to check that, there's a few things that you have to check. I mean, one of them is, you know, this marine line has broken now. Is my wind turbine still, you know, stable? Is it still like facing upwards? This is what this, this graph is telling you, okay? So from here, it seems like, well, you know, it's not very different than before the before the mooring line broke. Another one would be to check the, the loads within the, the mooring lines that are left, right? So we could check the actual loads as we did before. Uh, but yeah, this this would be things to things to check for this case. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know. Let's have a look. I know I don't know, but this is going to tell us. Uh, oh, I don't I don't have the gen the 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 um, I don't have the generator sensor, so I cannot give you the answer. I would have I would have had to add it, which I can put here, and we can see what the power is now. It's a bit tricky because with the uh, I mean, let me just close this so that we can see the the power better. So. An offshore wind turbine, like a floating wind turbine, moves a lot. And if it moves, you know, out of the wind or into the wind, you get more or less power, right? Because if the wind is coming from here and I'm moving this way, then 
uh, effectively the wind turbine is seeing more wind because it's kind of going into the wind. And when it goes like this, it's seeing less wind. So that's why you see these kind of you know lots of lots of fluctuations. Uh, there's ways to to alleviate these effects with you know if you play with the rotational speed or with the pitch of the blades. But so you know there's a, there was a lot of variation before the you know be, before the before the mooring line broke. So kind of giving a value now would also be difficult. But anyway, my guess is that not much actually. So you will lose a, you will lose a, a little bit of power because the wind turbine is kind of drifting away. But that speed is really low compared to the incoming wind speed. So without having done the check, my guess is that maybe not that much. Sorry, I should have said the question for, for those of you online, the question was how much has the power dropped after the mooring line broke? Um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, failure event, unless anyone has a question or wants to check something. OK, so let's let's close this one here. Um, yeah, OK, again, some information and we have a video that shows something is not the same, but it's some uh, it's, it's something similar. Um, OK, ultimately mistake fa failure. This is kind of. Uh, yeah, th th this, this is one that that I kind of like it's, it's I think it's kind of cool. So I'm opening this this uh, this model again, OK, and I'm going to add a sensor here. And this is going to give me the maximum normal stress in the in the tubular tower. And we can also look at the at the. The stress distribution. So I, I start my simulation now. And we can see. So you can see, so the color here is telling you how much uh, stress the elements have. OK, so you can see that the turbine is kind of oscillating. Uh, and when it's yeah, when it's oscillating, then you get a little bit of blue here. But you know, mostly we have like quite low. Quite low stresses here. This is a dynamic simulation, by the way. So that's why you get this oscillation, right? Because it's we're modeling uh, something that's happening in, in time simulation. We could do a static analysis, but because of what I want to show, uh, I chose the time simulation. Uh, and this oscillation is just the wind turbine kind of moving back and forth, right? This, this actually, I'm pretty sure that if I check, this is going to be the the first natural period, and you can see that, you know, here this is about you know 2.9 seconds, and the next peak is about six. So if I go and check the eigenfrequencies frequencies of my wind turbine, which you can do here. We're going to see that, yeah, so this is the mode that we're looking at. And indeed, the eigen period is you know, 3.1 seconds. Cool, so I set my simulation again. I have my, my maximum stress here. What is going to happen if I increase the wind speeds to, the, to, this, to, this, uh, to this graph? In terms of in terms of the kind of the, the the steady state value, not like the oscillations, but you have three options. You know, either it's going to increase, it's going to stay the same, or it's going to decrease, or something else. I don't know what that would be, but you know, any guesses? The trick question to decrease. Okay, let's see. We have we have a couple of increases. So, so that increase the wind speed. It, it's a pity that the simulation is is running so slow. But anyway, so as you saw, yeah. So you increase you increase the wind speed, and then you get like you know a couple of uh, a couple of oscillations. But then it's gonna it's gonna decay to to a nice you know steady value, which is higher than what it was. Cool. So. Yeah, very nice. You touched the first the first question. So the next question is, what happens if I increase the wind speed? Which sounds pretty much like the previous question. I mean, it is the same question, but it's gonna be it's gonna be a different results. So you know, I'm just gonna show it to you. If I increase the wind speed now, so again, you know, you get like these transients, uh, which yeah, you just get some transients, but actually the value. At which we're gonna at which we're gonna end up is lower than the previous one, and 
this is this is quite counterintuitive, and it's quite interesting that I mean, lots of people get it wrong. Like even people that kind of work in, with wind energy, uh, it's 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 it, yeah, it's something that's counterintuitive, and it will keep happening. So if I keep increasing the if I keep increasing the the wind speeds, it's just gonna kind of keep decreasing and decreasing, uh, and. Yeah, yeah, I changed the wind speed. Yeah, he went down. He went down. He went down. Look, I'm going to show you the wind speed. Okay, let's see. I have the wind speed here. So this is the wind speed. So the wind speed was at ten. Increase the wind speed, increase the maximum shear. Increase the wind speed, decrease the maximum shear. Increase again, decrease again. Okay, and I could keep doing this. I could keep like increasing the increasing the wind speed. And then the, the the shear is gonna is gonna decrease. So, do you do you have an idea of what happens, or should I should I just? Uh... Yes. Sorry. It has to do with the uh, it's well, it's not a coupling effect, but it has to do with the with the blades having changed. Yeah, correct. It's a pitch angle. So someone said it's the pitch angle. Yes, it's the pitch angle. Spot on. So I'm, I'm going to show you a couple more graphs. Uh, one is the power that we're producing, and the other one is the pitch angle, which is um, here. So let's have a look at the graph first, at the, at the power first. OK. So you can see that we were at 10, at 10 meters per second, and then my wind turbine was producing three and a half megawatts. We increased to 11 meters per second, and then we were producing four and something, 4.5. And then when we increased, we reached five megawatts, and then it stays constant at five megawatts from then on. This wind turbine has been designed to produce five megawatts. So you don't, even if the wind is stronger, you're not going to produce more, and that's because, well, for several reasons, but you know, mainly financially, it made sense to um, to design a, a, a generator and cables and, and you know a whole system that can cope with five megawatts, but not more than that. And yeah, if the wind is stronger, you're actually wasting energy, but that doesn't happen often enough that it's that it makes it worth designing a bigger wind turbine. Does does that, does that make sense? So, so the way and the way you uh, you try to keep the the power constant is by pitching the blades. So you can see now, I mean the pitch is quite small; it's about ten degrees. So I, I don't know how much you will see it, but yeah, you can see that the blades are a little bit pitched, you know. And th this is kind of the way it works. This is this is the way all modern wind turbines work: is that you you actually decrease the efficiency. So if I show you the efficiency, which is this. Power coefficient here. Yeah, maybe I can delete a couple of graphs. This is the efficiency. So we started at 50 uh, 50 percent efficiency, which is quite good for a you know for a wind turbine like this. And then that's kind of the maximum that you can do. And once you reach your maximum power, you're purposefully decreasing your efficiency. So you're not taking as much you know wind energy as you could. Um, so yeah, so so that was the explanation for this one. Does this? Yes. So the question is, there is a mechanical system inside the, the blade that when the power goes to five megawatts, so slowly it rotates the blade. So it's a mechanical movement. Yeah? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there is the the question was whether there is a a, a, me a mechanical me motor inside the blade that actually turns the you know, pitches the blades. Yeah. And yes, that's the the answer is yes. That's that's how it works. Um. Do you see these little peaks here? So there's like lots of little uh, peaks here. So this, well, do you want to guess what it is first, and then I can then I can say it. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah, it's the blade passing the tower. So every time the blade passes the tower, you can see that the aerodynamic loads, which are these blue vectors. So this is the first. You can see that they decrease a bit, and that's because the the tower is kind of blocking the wind, right? So the the wind has to go around the tower, and that's slowing down the wind just in front of the tower. That's called the the tower shadow effect. 
And it's very important when you're designing your controller. So when you're designing the system that is going to decide how fast the, the, the rotor is rotating and how to pitch the blades. When you design this, it's very important that you make sure that the frequency of the of the of the of this tower shadow, the blade passing frequency is called, doesn't match the eigen frequency of your superstructure, because otherwise you could get resonant effects. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on to the to to the next one, unless anyone wants to ask some something. Cool. So let's move this and. Yeah, OK, so. Actually, this so when I was talking about about doing this seminar, like, you know, someone told me, oh, yeah, there's this, you know, there's this picture of a wind turbine that that broke probably because of a, because of a storm or something. And it, it was this this uh, this picture and. And that's. You know that is the misconception. So the maximum loads on the tower, like the, the maximum stresses, don't occur in the storm. They occur when you're the closest to the rated wind speeds, to your rated conditions. In this case, it's 11.4 meters per second. When there is a massive storm, the blades start pitching, and then the loads on the tower are actually really low. So yeah, so so this is the this is what I put this this uh, these pictures because you know it it's it's common to get it wrong. And actually, if you if you zoom in here, what you see is that what broke is the it, it's it's actually the the foundation itself. So I think that you guys know much more uh, than me about this. Uh, but but yeah, that, that, what what broke here is the, like the the way it was anchored to the to the ground. Um, cool. So okay, yeah, again. Some uh, some information on, on the YouTube video. I mean, I'll, I'll share the the slides later anyway. Um, yeah, I don't have that much time left. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna talk quickly about about fatigue. Um, so when you're running, so what we saw right now was ultimate limit state. Uh, you know what's the you know what's the Oh well, actually, I could show you. Uh, I should show ultimate limit state on a, on a, an offshore wind turbine because it's the the results are quite different. So if again we show the stresses here, so the maximum stress, I can plot them both in the same graph, and show this again. So right now we're at yeah ten meters per second can. Set it to 11 meters per second. So now we're quite close to this rated wind speed. So we're quite close to producing five megawatts. So as we saw before, this is the situation in which we get the maximum uh, the maximum stress in the tubular tower here. Okay, and in this you know in this particular context for this particular model, it turns out that the the stresses in the tower, which is red, or the maximum stress in the tower. Is larger than the maximum stress in the in the monopile, which is this one. The monopile, sorry, the monopile is this part here. Okay, is the is, is the part of the support structure that goes underwater. So you have like, you know, this part underwater, the monopile, and then you put a tubular tower on top, which is the the higher part. This is what happens in operating conditions. This is like a normal, you know, normal windy day. This is what we get. If you have a massive storm. The simulation doesn't look like this at all. What would happen is that you would have what we call you would have the turbine what we call idling. So the blades will be pitched 90 degrees. Oops, sorry. Did I not press? Yeah, I think I missed. I didn't press enter. So the blades would be pitched 90 degrees because as we explained before, you're trying to you know avoid getting too much uh, well. Too much, too many, too much wind loads in your, in your, uh, in your wind turbine. And yeah, I'm just gonna remove the, the control system so that, so that this stays as it is. And and you would also get some, you know, massive waves, not like what we have here. So for that, I could say that I want this, this nonlinear waves that are called stream function waves. So you know, if you if you know what this means, that's really cool. If you don't, just it's just a massive wave. It's just a big, 
a, a, a big problematic wave. Okay, so now I have this this uh, stream function wave. And now you can see, so I mean, now we have very, very little uh, loads from the wind. Well, I guess also because the, the wind is relatively is relatively small. In a storm, the wind might be bigger, but we have relatively uh, small loads from the wind. So we have very small, uh, very small stresses both in the in the tower and and in the monopile. But now, when the when the these big waves come in, then you, you're going to see that the the stress really really increases. And now, so what changes now is that the the maximum stress is not in the tubular tower anymore; is in the monopile. So now you're in a situation where the hydrodynamic loads, so the, the, the wave loads, are actually what are being problematic, and it's is what what is driving the design. You also see some, uh, you know, so, some kind of decay, uh, yeah, decay effect where you, know, you have a big load, you start moving the turbine, and then it kind of oscillates a bit, which is something that you have to that you have to look into. But yeah, so that's that's what I wanted to say is that if you if you move offshore, then the situation changes. Then the maximum loads occur. They do occur with you know a, a big uh, a big storm. Yeah, I know you have another one of these big waves. So you know again a again a strong peak here. Cool. I'm gonna. Oh yeah, and I can show you a last thing. Uh, so can you see here? So the blade started vertical, and it's like being it's, it's been moving a little bit, and that's on purpose. Um, when you have a storm or when you're stopping the wind turbine for whatever reason, you well. If it's for maintenance, if it's for going up there and working, then you will you will put a break so that nothing nothing moves. But if if not, then typically you want your blades to move a little bit, and that is because if the if the if the blades were always in the same position, the rotor was always in the same position, you would get a lot of wear and tear on the bearings, you know, because it will be like the the bearings uh, of the main shaft will always have will, will would always be facing the same uh, the same way. So you want you you want some rotation so that you kind of you know wear different parts of the of, well, of the whole system I guess um, and yeah that's called idling that's uh, my wind turbine is idling so I'm going to close this now and yeah I mean I don't I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna skip uh, the fatigue but yeah th there's two different or there's several things to check but two of them are. ULS, which is ultimate limit state. So what happens in a big, big storm? The other one is FLS, fatigue uh, limit uh, states, which is, you know, if you have a wind turbine running for 20 years, like the materials are going to be vibrating and you know, there's cracks that are going to be uh, created. And like, you know, how do you, how do you account for that? How do you design your wind turbine so that that doesn't happen or rather that it happens after a certain period of time? So today, I think you design wind turbines to last 20, 25 years. So you, you run a fatigue analysis and then you make sure that your turbine is not going to crack after 20 years. So there's a few things that I want to say about this. Uh, I'm not going to show them because I, I don't have that much time, but you typically need to run thousands of simulations because you want to run like, you know, the wind comes from here and the waves come from here. And then you want the very strong wind, but small waves, and then strong waves and small wind. So, you know, you have like lots of different combinations of environmental conditions. And then you have current and you have, so you end up with like really lots of simulations, thousands of simulations. And then you do some, well, you know, you run some algorithms to kind of check how much damage each of these individual simulation is bringing into your, uh, in, into your wind turbine. And then you you combine this and you check you know you check how much damage you got from a particular situation, but you also need to know how frequently that situation occurs. And what comes out of this uh, often is that the most most of the damage doesn't come from the big storms. It comes from the situation that we saw before, the situation where you know you get loads close to you are a situation close to your uh, rated situation. And that is big. Well, it's because of the because of what we saw, because the, that's when the aerodynamic loads are the strongest. But it's also because it's the cases that occur most of the time. So when you run a fatigue analysis, it's important to kind of have an idea of how often different uh, different situations occur. And 
Okay, I mean, very briefly, I'm running out of time and out of battery. So I guess it'd be interesting to talk about buckling. Uh, but I think it's likely that you guys know much more about buckling than I do. So that's why there's a question mark, uh, because I was hoping that, you know, maybe you would be able to 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 help with this. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so I mean, buckling. Buckling is not really a problem for wind turbines. Uh, they're not long enough and the load at the top is not is not uh, heavy enough. The mass of the the mass of the of of the nacelle here is, is not heavy enough that you get uh, buckling within within your wind turbine. So so it's generally not something that we're very concerned about. But we we're still interested. So something that we are looking. So when I say we, I mean like we at the at the company at Sphinx. We're kind of curious to see how you know how you define buckling and how how you do. Stability analysis. Um, I mean, there is a you know there's the earlier formula that tells you what's the the buckling load, and you know I guess that you just try to not to not go over that. But in a, in a nonlinear context, how do you you know when do you say that your structure is is buckling? If I if I think about beam elements, and so just to illustrate what I mean. So I can, yeah, I can lock the bearings. So now the, the, the wind turbine is not is not going to be able to rotate anymore. It's like I'm applying a brake on the on the wind turbine. And I also want to run a static analysis now. OK, and so if I start my simulation now. So not, not much happens because I have, well, I have no wind. I have disa disabled the wind. And I have, you know, the mass of the nacelle is not that much here. If I increase the mass, so it's 240 tons. If I say that I have, I don't know, 6,000 tons. I think I checked that earlier and that was. OK, that was too much, sorry. Uh, let's see. So if I said I have, you know, 4,000 tons. Oh no, that's 40,000. Maybe that's the problem, no? So, you know, so now you. you if, if I if I show you the, this this node here, this one, that's the center of gravity of the nacelle. The nacelle is the nacelle is this this part, right? So it's a little bit behind. So if I increase the if I increase the mass of the nacelle a lot, that's why out of battery. That's why my that's why my my wind turbine is kind of tilting backwards. And if I increase this load again, you stay to six. As, as I said before, then you're just like, you know, kind of bending more and more. So this is kind of a question for you, uh, for those of you who know about Berkeley and, and how, how that is how that is done in, in, in the context of, you know, finite element analysis and and, and beam elements. Like, is that, is that something that you do? Is that, is, is that how you perform a stability analysis? Would you say, you know, we just increase the load and see what happens or you know, is is there anyone that that can comment on that? Yeah. Actually, I'm working on four form steel structures, so it's all to have the buckling problem. Uh -huh. So we have uh, three types of buckling, so one local buckling, uh -huh. so it's the thickness ratio is very important. Uh -huh. And then we have the distortion buckling and also global buckling. So there's three types. So we have the geometrical imperfection of influence uh, that one, and also we have the Fine strip analysis, not fine element analysis, so it's okay. more easier than computational. Okay, so that's a different type of analysis. Yeah. Do you do it with finite elements or, or that's yeah, it? Yeah, fine element also analysis. finite elements. Yeah, okay. not B elements, so it's not that we did that much like yeah. that one. Uh -huh. Control entire approach. We can follow the Euro code uh -huh. and do a strange space of the link state check. Okay. This is it because you might have stress the same thing whether you exceed one or not. Okay. And this complements my elements because you're measuring stress. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, you don't want it bad thing, but at least you approach it uh, on a cold basis. Okay, so yeah, so you model, you do this simulation, probably well, static or dynamic, I guess that both would give you a result. And then with this stress, you go to the Eurocodes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you. 
in theory you never or you know in practice you never you never want to to get into 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 buckles so i guess that having an approach like this should be a uh, yeah should, should be sufficient the challenge with the code just before is that this design uh -huh. so when you're doing an assessment in theory you should use the difference in part but well, that's another discussion huh? that's the same. yeah 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 okay because design and assessment are different things right yeah yeah but in the end you design you know you want to design based on on, on your simulations no yeah if it's for design it's certainly fine if yeah. it's fine for the turbine and i want to see for x y z the moment I was going to perform, then the procedure should be updated for assessment. Right. It's not strictly speaking down, by the way. Okay. Nice. Yeah. I mean, so that's that's very interesting. Uh, it's very relevant for for what you're doing. And so yeah, th thanks a lot for that. Um. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's uh, that's that's all I had for uh, for now. It's exactly four, or almost four. So yeah. So I guess that's that's all. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for being here. Don't like, don't hesitate to to get in touch with us. Have a look at this if if you find it uh, interesting or relevant. And um, and yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, thanks a lot for attending this. Oh, is there a question? Sorry. Yeah, 